Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video, Napoleon's Retreat from Moscow. Let's get into it. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. The 15th of September, 1812. 83 days after invading Russia, a week after his costly victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered Moscow. He expected to be greeted by dignitaries, formally offering the city's surrender. Instead, he discovered that 90% of Moscow's inhabitants had fled. A fire had started the previous night, and was blamed on drunken soldiers. But over the next 48 hours, fires continued to break out across Moscow, until most of the city was ablaze. Count Fyodor Rostopchin, the city's governor, had ordered that Moscow be destroyed, rather than allowed to fall into enemy hands. Okay, so, in the comment section, uh, a couple of different people have pointed out parallels between this and the way that Alexander the Great and the Macedonian army were handled by the Persian army whenever the invasion of the Macedonian army happened. And really, this is what it comes down to, right? Moscow is the, the crown jewel. And when push came to shove, it was a... We don't care. Burn it to the ground before Napoleon gets it. Like, if you have the land, the territory that Russia has, and your mindset is this dead set on going full scorched earth, there's really nothing Napoleon can do. I mean, really, there's really nothing he can do. The Persians were not willing to do this. Their cities were, they believed, were too grand had too much money, um, they just weren't willing to do anything close to this. And so it's a totally different situation and you're forced to take land battles to try to repel the enemy. In this case, you are not forced to do anything. You're forcing Napoleon's hand because his army is too big to survive this far behind enemy lines without anything around him. He has no supplies, no food, no anything. Um, this really, really explains how dedicated Russia was to destroying Napoleon's army, was we will literally burn this place to the ground if it means pushing your army out. That's, that's wild. And now fires were being started deliberately by Russian criminals freed from jail and acting on police orders. French soldiers rounded up and shot any they could catch. But the inferno was impossible to contain. In four days, two-thirds of Moscow was destroyed. With the fires finally under control, Napoleon's soldiers turned their attention to systematically looting the ruined city. While from his new quarters in the Kremlin, Napoleon sent a letter to Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg, inviting him to make peace and end the war. He received no reply. Napoleon waited, confident that Alexander would eventually negotiate. But as the days passed, he grew increasingly uneasy. Cossack raids were disrupting his vital communications with Paris, 
as well as the arrival of supplies. While the steady attrition of French forces and Russian reinforcements meant Napoleon was outnumbered for the first time in the campaign. Rumours also reached him that his reluctant allies, Prussia and Austria, were in secret talks with his enemies. Napoleon had proposed that the army winter in Moscow, but that now looked too dangerous. Reluctantly, he accepted that the army would have to move back to Smolensk to find safe winter quarters. Napoleon knew how severe Russian winters could be, but continued to put off his departure, reassured by fine October weather, and hoping that at the last minute there might be a message from Alexander offering peace. It never came. That's so interesting that th these are extremely dire circumstances that Napoleon finds himself in, right? He is way, way behind enemy lines. He is now outnumbered by the Russian army, which is right around the corner. Um, Cossacks are just, you know, wreaking havoc on his supply lines and communication lines. And still, and, and the Russian winter is almost here, which will almost certainly be awful for the French army. And still... He is holding out that Alexander will make peace. What, what a wild mindset that is. That like, all of these things are going against me. Russia would rather burn Moscow to the ground than concede to me. And yet, I still think that they would be willing to make peace just because I'm in Moscow. I don't know, that's, that's a weird... That's a weird sort of mindset here. On the 13th of October, the first light snow fell. Five days later, Kutuzov launched a surprise attack on Murad's advance guard at Vinkova and defeated it. Napoleon, stung into action, gave the order for the army to leave Moscow the next day. Our video sponsor, the legendary World of Tanks, is the home of online multiplayer Armoured Mayhem. Thank you to World of Tanks for supporting this video. Wow. 100. That's a hell of a quote. Like, that's a hell of a quote. You've been pushed back. You've gone full scorched earth. Like that really tells you what the Russian mindset was. That is a wild quote. That tells you that like this was the plan. This was the plan. We are going to essentially starve them to death. And then as soon as they got to the breaking point, Alexander was like, all right, now, now's the time. Like now we start our side. That's wild thousand men of the Grande Armée left Moscow in a column 10 miles long, with an estimated 40,000 carriages and carts. There were women and children too, army wives and the vivandières, the women who cooked for the soldiers, as well as some civilians. Every wagon and pack was stuffed with as much food and loot as possible. As he set off, Sergeant Bourgogne of the Imperial Guard made an inventory of his pack. It contained several pounds of sugar, some rice, some biscuit, half a bottle of liqueur, a woman's Chinese silk dress embroidered in gold and silver, several gold and silver ornaments, amongst them a piece of the cross of Ivan the Great. Besides these, I had my uniform, a woman's large riding cloak, two silver pictures in relief, 12 inches long and eight high, all in the finest workmanship also several lockets, and a Russian prince's spittoon set with precious stones. I wore over my shirt a yellow silk waistcoat, which I had made myself out of a woman's skirt. Over that, a large cape lined with ermine, and a large pouch hung at my side by a silver cord. This was full of various things, amongst them a crucifix in gold and silver, and a little Chinese porcelain vase. 
Then there were my firearms, powder flask and 60 cartridges in the box. This heavily encumbered army did not yet realise it was in a race against time. The Russians were beginning to move against the flanks of Napoleon's 550 mile deep salient. That very day, Wittgenstein's army was driving back Marshal Saint-Cyr's outnumbered force at Polatsk, and drawing Victor's IX Corps west to support them. In the south, Admiral Chichagov's advance had Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps falling back to cover Warsaw. The corridor was closing. And then there was the weather. Though Napoleon was confident his army could reach winter quarters in Smolensk in 20 days, well before the more extreme temperatures were due to hit. Napoleon planned to withdraw via Kaluga, through unspoilt country where the army could forage for supplies. But Kutuzov sent General Dokturov's 6th Corps to block the road at Maloyaroslavets. In fierce fighting, Italian troops of Eugène's 4th Corps drove the Russians out of the town. It was a hard-won victory, reminiscent of the fighting at Borodino. Kutuzov now stood between Napoleon and Kaluga. Napoleon now took the unusual step of conferring with his marshals. And after discussing various options, he decided that rather than seek another major battle, they would retreat the way they'd come, along the Smolensk road. Napoleon had hoped to avoid this route, as it meant marching back through country already stripped bare of supplies. The day after the fighting at Maloyaroslavets, Napoleon was nearly captured by a group of Cossacks and saved only by General Rapp's charge at the head of his escort. After this close shave, Napoleon had a phial of poison made up, which he carried around his neck in case of capture. Napoleon's army set off on its new course, shadowed at a respectful distance by Kutuzov's army to the south. They passed the old battlefield of Borodino, a grisly, unnerving sight where crows pecked at half-buried corpses. Relentless marching quickly began to tire out men and horses. A few days later, the temperature fell below freezing. The army's overworked, starving horses died en masse. Discipline began to break down, as some drivers simply dumped the sick and wounded by the roadside to try to ensure their own survival. As the French column became increasingly strung out, General Miloradovich, commanding Kutuzov's advance guard, fell on Davout's rear guard outside Vyazma. For a few hours, Davout's first corps was cut off, until Eugène and Ney came to his rescue. The battle ended with street fighting in Vyazma, as the French hastily evacuated the burning town. For the soldiers of the Grande Armée, so unaccustomed to retreats and routs, Vyazma was an alarming, demoralising blow. Yeah, this is incredibly interesting because you've seen the whole time throughout all of these battles, all of these wars basically, that Napoleon is always the one on the attack. He's always the one, he's attacking retreating armies, he's attacking rear guards. That is what he's good at, that's what the army's good at, and obviously that is great for the morale of, of the army. Right now, they are on the total opposite side. They are trying to get back to Smolensk as fast as they possibly can. They are, you know, completely weighed down by all of this nonsense, really. They have sick and wounded. It's getting cold. And all the while, 
Cossacks are still doing raids. They're still hitting supply lines and communication lines. And there's a massive Russian army that's basically just watching you die off as you go. And every time you show a slight weak spot, you get a little too spread out, something hits a snag, they send somebody in and, and hit. It's a really, really dangerous situation for Napoleon here. And a situation that he and nobody in his army is accustomed to. On the 4th of November, it began to snow heavily. The next night, temperatures plummeted to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Few men or women had proper winter clothing or access to shelter. Many froze to death overnight. The next morning, wagons and guns were abandoned. Many soldiers sought to save themselves, ignoring officers, stealing horses and food, and leaving the column to scour the countryside for supplies. Many of these foragers were found by the Cossacks. Some cut down or lanced, others robbed of every possession and left to freeze. In a few cases, they were handed over to peasants, eager for retribution against the foreign invaders who had plundered all they owned. As the army struggled on towards Smolensk through blizzards, Napoleon ordered Eugène's 4th Corps to strike out for Vitebsk, where there were large French supply depots. But Vitebsk had already fallen to the Russians. 4th Corps was too weak to fight its way through, and rejoined the army, minus its artillery and most of its baggage. A colonel who saw 4th Corps at this stage described men without shoes, almost without clothes, exhausted and famished, sitting on their packs, sleeping on their knees, and only rousing themselves out of this stupor to grill slices of horse meat or melt bits of ice. Just three weeks after leaving Moscow, a third of the army was dead or captured. About half the rest formed a growing army of stragglers, men without units, prepared to fight only to survive. Napoleon reached Smolensk on the 9th of November. The first troops into town ransacked the supply depots, leaving nothing for those who followed, including Ney's rearguard, which arrived six days later. Napoleon had hoped to make Smolensk his winter base, but the state of the army and lack of supplies meant the retreat had to continue. But the five days he spent there gave Kutuzov time to circle ahead and prepare an ambush. When the French retreat resumed, he struck 30 miles west of Smolensk at Krasny. In three days of desperate fighting through knee-deep snow, Napoleon used his Imperial Guard to hold open the road, as Eugène and Davout's corps fought their way through the ambush with heavy losses. Two regiments of the Young Guard were ordered to make a sacrificial counterattack to keep the Russians at bay, and were virtually annihilated. Kutuzov held back many of his troops, and was blamed for not trying to destroy Napoleon's army when he had the chance. It's possible he was concerned at the number of raw conscripts in his own army, also suffering terribly in the freezing conditions. Not every French corps broke through at Krasny. Marshal Ney and his 6,000-strong rearguard arrived on the 18th of November to find the road blocked by 60,000 Russian troops, and no sign of the promised support from Davout's 1st Corps. Ney's men hurled themselves against the Russian lines with desperate courage, but were mown down. 
Rejecting several invitations to surrender, Ney led the survivors in a daring night crossing of the Dnipro River. Then across 45 miles of open country, under constant attack from Platov's Cossacks, to reach Orsha. By the time Ney rejoined the army, his rearguard was down to just 800 fighting men, leading a column of several thousand stragglers. The army regarded his escape as a miracle, and when Napoleon heard of it, he immediately dubbed Marshal Ney the bravest of the brave. Yeah, but what... What's the overall purpose of that? Like, sure, some, somewhat, it got back to the army, but not really. I mean, and there's only 800 of them, so you lost the vast majority of the unit. They gave you multiple chances to surrender. Even if you get back to the army, you're in the same position where you're trying as hard as you can to retreat with all of the stuff going on around you. This is... Uh, this is a situation where mass desertion is extremely common, right? Where things break down to the point, conditions are so brutal that everybody just looks around and goes like, the hell with this. It's every man for himself. There's mass desertion similar to what happens with Russia in World War I, where everybody just kind of takes off. Um, that is what is kind of happening already with a bunch of people, you know, dipping out. But it's the threat that the whole army can just disintegrate at any moment. Um, so I, I will, maybe it's a morale boost for the overall army for Ney to get back there at, in one piece, right? That just seemed like, uh, I don't know, overblown maybe? Like you, you sacrifice basically your whole unit to get there. Uh, I, I don't know. beginning to be serious yeah i would say so napoleon had escaped one trap but now three russian armies were closing in from different directions and outnumbered him nearly three to one from the east kutuzov's main army with 65,000 men from the north wittgenstein with 30,000 steadily driving back Marshal Victor's IX Corps. And from the south, Admiral Chichagov's Army of Moldavia, with 34,000, having detached General Osten Zakhen with 30,000, to prevent Schwarzenberg's Austrians and Renier's Saxon Corps marching to Napoleon's aid. Napoleon was heading for Minsk, a major French supply base with vast stores of the food, clothing, shoes and ammunition that his army so desperately needed. But on the 21st of November, disastrous news arrived. Minsk had fallen to Chichagov. He'd then marched on Borisov, driven out the Polish garrison, and captured its bridge over the Berezina River. By rights, the Berezina ought to have frozen solid by now so Napoleon could have crossed anywhere. But a sudden thaw had turned the river into a torrent of ice and freezing water. Napoleon was at least joined by the hard-fighting Marshal Udino and his second corps, which hadn't suffered as badly as the main column on its retreat from Polatsk. Udino launched an immediate counter-attack on Borisov and retook the town, but couldn't stop the Russians burning the bridge. With no other bridge for miles in either direction, it seemed Napoleon's exhausted army was finally doomed. But there was one sliver of hope. Polish cavalry had found a ford across the river, near the village of Studienka, Napoleon issued a flurry of orders. Second Corps was to fake preparations for a river crossing south of Borisov. Victor's Ninth Corps, arriving from the north, was to form a rear guard east of Studienka to hold the Russians at bay. 
while engineers worked as quickly as possible to build pontoon bridges across the river and win Napoleon's army a fighting chance of escape. On the afternoon of the 25th of November, General Eblay's Dutch engineers began building two 300-foot pontoon bridges across the Berezina River. They worked day and night, sometimes chest deep in freezing water, and completed both bridges in less than 24 hours. Few wow. of the engineers survived the ordeal. Chichagov had been totally fooled by the diversion south of Borisov, and was moving his troops south to face it, allowing Napoleon's army to begin crossing its rickety bridges virtually unopposed. Udino's second this is interesting. I feel like Napoleon had gone into a lull where he wasn't really acting or commanding like himself. It was almost like he was going through the motions. Um, even on the offensives going in, I just felt like the, the creativity of the way that he was a general had just totally gone away. Um, I don't know if that was because of illness. I don't know if that was because of hubris um, and maybe he just thought that his army was so much better they didn't need that but this is the first time that I've seen in a while in these videos of him doing something clever really quickly to kind of outsmart the enemy. Second Corps led the way to secure a bridgehead followed the next day by the remnants of the main army. Priority was given to formed troops, still able to fight. For the time being, the army's vast crowd of stragglers remained on the far bank. By the time Chichagov realised his mistake and began moving north, Napoleon had troops in place to defend the crossing. On the east bank, General Partonneur's 12th Division 4,000 relatively fresh troops from Victor's 9th Corps formed the rearguard. As Platov's Cossacks approached from the east, the vanguard of Kutuzov's main army, Partoneur tried to rejoin 9th Corps. But caught in a swirling blizzard, with visibility down to 50 meters, he marched straight into Wittgenstein's army. His entire division was killed or captured. The next morning, Chichagov and Wittgenstein launched coordinated attacks on both sides of the river. There was desperate fighting on the West Bank, where Marshal Udino was, yet again, seriously wounded, but his Swiss infantry held the line, until General Dumerck's cuirassiers the army's last heavy cavalry charged and routed the Russians. At great cost, Polish and German troops of Victor's rearguard held off the Russians until dark, then pulled back across the bridges. For two nights, officers had been trying to get the vast camp of stragglers to cross the bridges when they weren't being used. But with temperatures reaching minus 30 centigrade, they'd preferred to stay put, huddled around their fires. At dawn on the 29th, with the army leaving and the Russians approaching, thousands of stragglers surged in panic towards the bridges. Dozens were crushed underfoot. Others fell or were pushed into the water, or tried to swim, which was certain death. When French engineers burned the bridges at 9am, thousands were cut off and left to the mercy of the advancing Cossacks. Some became prisoners. Others were simply put out of their misery. That was actually pretty impressive. I mean, as, as terrible as this situation is and 
as horrible as the the what happened with the stragglers there with the way things have been with how cold it is with how bad morale is um with all of the units like almost completely disintegrating or just not having um you, you know they don't have the discipline that they would normally have um i did not think you you know you you wouldn't think that they would be able to put together a plan and actually hold the defense like this with the rear guards fighting with them uh holding the line from the the front coming up south uh, on the far side of the river there was there was kind of a lot of moving pieces there and you would think that with things going as badly as they are there wouldn't be enough of a french army left to do something like that so i'm kind of impressed that even at this point they were able to make that happen Since the retreat began 43 days earlier, the Grande Armée had marched nearly 500 miles, under constant attack, starved, exhausted, and for the last 23 days, in lethal sub-zero temperatures, without proper clothing or shelter. In that time, the fighting strength of the Grande Armée had been reduced from around 124,000 men to 20,000, with as many stragglers still following the army. As the retreat continued to Vilna, the weather turned even worse, the temperatures falling to minus 37 degrees centigrade. The Russian armies at least now held back, leaving the winter, Cossacks and Russian peasants to finish off the invaders. On the 5th of December, Napoleon left the army, travelling incognito across Europe at breakneck speed, and reaching Paris in just 13 days. Naturally, English satirists capitalised on Napoleon seeming to abandon his defeated army. And many soldiers did regard it as an act of betrayal, but his generals supported his decision to leave. There'd already been one attempted coup against Napoleon in Paris, and there was much work to be done to rebuild the army and reassure France's allies. On the 9th of December, 51 days... That's interesting. I'm curious what y'all think about that. Because on one hand, the, the main focus here is the survival of the new French state, right? And so it's obviously going to need an army. You've still got every terrible thing that's happening in Spain uh, with the guerrilla forces and the, the British and Portuguese and Spanish armies. Um, so the, the big thing is the survival of the state. So what do y'all think? Do y'all think it was just outright abandonment on Napoleon's part? Or do y'all think that that was actually prudent on his part? That, like some of his followers suggested, that that was the move. That he needed to get things in order. He needed to start to rebuild the French state. Um, and that that was the main thing that needed to be done regardless of how it looked. I'm curious what y'all think about that. Is after the retreat began, around 20,000 ragged survivors of the Grande Armée began crossing the Nyman River back into friendly Polish territory. According to legend, Marshal Ney was the last man across. Jeez. Napoleon's invasion of Russia had proved to be one of the greatest military disasters in history. He had made fatal miscalculations about geography, logistics, and above all, Russia's political and strategic response to his invasion. These blunders cost his empire around half a million men, as well as a quarter of a million horses and a thousand cannon. 
put another way. Of every 12 men who marched into Russia with the Grande Armée, one was killed in action or died of wounds. Two were taken prisoner, one of whom died in captivity. Seven died from disease or the effects of climate. Just two returned alive. Wow. Contrary to myth, many more soldiers had died in the summer advance from heat, typhus and dysentery than were lost in the winter retreat. Russian military casualties were estimated at 150,000 and a huge but unknown number of civilian deaths. The Russian campaign was a catastrophe for Napoleon. Not just in lost troops and resources, but in damage to prestige and reputation. Yeah, that's the big thing here, right? Is he's on a huge winning streak. And although he's had his issues here and there, um, he's definitely had his issues in Spain, he still has this just stranglehold over Europe and then like the essentially the entire continent surrounding it. Um, it wasn't until the advance into Russia that act, one of his armies was just demolished, right? And so, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big hit. He, he went from this guy that couldn't, you know, couldn't be beaten, um, at least, you know, by a conventional state and a conventional army, um, to one that was fleeing Russia, you know, with his tail between his legs. That winter, all his enemies sensed weakness and prepared to join forces against him. But the Emperor wasn't going down without a fight. Back in Paris, he admitted to his ministers, Fortune has dazzled me, gentlemen. I've let it lead me astray. Instead of following my plan, I went to Moscow. I thought I'd make peace there. I stayed too long. I've made a grave mistake but I'll have the means to repair it. Thank you. Okay, so that was Napoleon's terrible, terrible retreat from Moscow. Um, man, that is just, that entire campaign, start to finish, the Russian campaign, is just such a brutal one. Um, yeah, that's just, it's just such a brutal campaign. Um, and obviously, Hitler did not read the book very well on how that went, um, seeing as how he will make the same mistakes, or a lot of the same mistakes, um, in World War II. But yeah, uh, like, comment, subscribe. I'll get to the next Napoleon video tomorrow. Uh, I may release the other recorded video for part two of the Winter War series that I started. We'll see. Today or tomorrow, I'll release it. It's already recorded. But I'll see you guys then.